Let's work through both parts one and two of the third problem on the practice exam. So you have a randomized optimization algorithm with a one in n log n chance of yielding the optimal solution to a problem. Each run of the algorithm has the same independent chance of returning the optimal solution. How many times should you run the algorithm to upper bound the probability of its failure by one over e? So each time we run this algorithm, we have a one in n log n chance of succeeding, of getting the optimal solution. And we want to know how many times we have to run it in order to get this bound on its failure. Uh, so what's the probability that it fails on a given run? That's going to be one minus the probability it succeeds, one minus n o, one over n log n. This is the probability that it fails in one run. Uh, to fail if we run it twice, it has to fail both times, because if it succeeds either time, we'll use that better solution. Since this is an optimization problem, typically we can tell which of two solutions is better, and we'll just pick the better one. If we find the optimal solution, we will always pick it, and so we'll always end up with the optimal solution if we get it at any moment. So anyway, if we run this twice, our probability of failure is going to be the probability of failing each time. So it'll be one over, sorry, one minus one over n log n times one minus one over n log n. That's one minus one over n log n squared. If we run this more times, if we run this many, many times, we could say this is going to end up being one minus one over n log n to the x power. And what power do we want to raise this to to upper bound that quantity by one over e? Well, we saw when we worked through these randomization problems that this formula, one minus one over n to the nth, that is less than or equal to one over e for n greater than or equal to one. Now, uh-oh, we have n log n in here, not n, right? But we've already dealt with that. When we worked through problems in class, we also saw a case where we had n choose two down on the bottom instead of n log n, and we were still able to use the same identity. The point is that this n down here is not the same n as this n up here, or at least it doesn't have to be. This is a totally separate formula, so it's a totally separate variable, and we can go through and rename this variable if we want. So I can call this y. Now, hopefully you see it as pretty comfortable to say, well, n log n here, that can be equal to y. We get to choose x, right? So we can choose x equal y. And when we do, then we're going to be able to use this formula down below. So we want to say 1 minus 1 over n log n raised to the n log n. That will be less than or equal to 1 over e for n log n greater than or equal to 1. When is n log n greater than or equal to 1? Uh, well, let's see. Um, does it work for one? Well, the log base two of one, the log base, any reasonable base of one is just zero. So no, this is not greater than or equal to one for n equals one. And does it work for two? Uh, the log base two of two is just one. So this part is just one when n equals two, and that part is two. So yeah, that's greater than or equal to one. And we know n log n is an increasing function. So once we're greater than or equal to one, we'll stay greater than or equal to one. So we will choose, we will repeat this algorithm n log n times. And uh, we just want to think about uh, what if, in fact, n is equal to 1? Are, are we all messed up at that point? Uh, well, if n is equal to 1, we're saying we'll repeat the algorithm 0 times. Uh, that's probably not a great idea. Uh, but then again, if n is equal to 1, then a 1 over n log n chance of yielding the optimal solution is an infinite chance. We're 1 over 0, or undefined, or something like that. So this problem is probably ill-defined anyway for n equals 1. But I'm just going to say for n greater than or equal to 2. And then we don't have to worry about that. Now. Down here, it asks to list three reasons we might use randomization in an algorithm. And we, we've just seen one. One reason we might use randomization in an algorithm is because we want to uh, amplify the probability of a simple algorithm's success by repeating it over and over again. Uh, so that's one good example. By the way, I'm going to say I'll go ahead and list three, but there might be more than three. This is just stuff to think about. So um, amplify probability of success of 
a simple algorithm. And that's what we saw in our randomization unit. We had also previously seen quick select and quick sort, and that was a good example of transitioning from average to expected performance. Now, I hope you're not just sitting there writing that down. I hope you're asking, ah, oh, do I know what average and expected performance are and why I would want expected versus average? Well, remember, average case performance is a bound on the average over some distribution of the possible inputs, often a uniform distribution over all possible inputs. If your worst case is worse than your average case, it means that there are some inputs scalable inputs, so inputs for any given problem size, for which you do badly. Okay, And if that's the case, if you have an ill-behaving user, either just by coincidence or because they're intentionally ill-behaving, then they can attack your algorithm. That's become increasingly important recently in the real world. So we have seen examples where people used algorithms that were good in the average case and they ignored the fact that eventually, once they got popular enough, there would be people out there with an incentive for profit or twisted fun to attack that algorithm. And it's happened. It happened with Java's hash tables quite recently, uh, and that was very damaging. On the other hand, something that's got good expected case performance that average for expected case performance, it's still an average performance, but it's not an average over the inputs. It's an average over the random numbers generated by your random number generator. Uh, so it's an average over, if you've got a source of true randomness, for example, true randomness. That's a good thing. The, the odds, you can make the odds of your expected performance algorithm behaving badly, very, very low. Um, and furthermore, it's not in any way dependent on your user's behavior. It's dependent only on the quality of your random number generator. So this one, uh, quicksort, is kind of the classic example of that. Uh, and uh, I feel a little awkward saying that this is a separate reason because it's kind of coupled to number one, but I'm going to say simplify a complex algorithm. And and the example here, although quick select also fits in the one above, a good example here is quick select because deterministic select already gave us linear time selection of any order statistic including the median that we might have wanted. Quick select only does the same thing and it, it gets an asymptotic bound that is no better than deterministic select and in the worst case is worse. But quick select is much, 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 much easier to write than deterministic select, and in practical terms, it's faster. Okay, so maybe we could combine this with you know practically improve runtime. And you know, one reason we didn't discuss in class that I'd love to bring up here while you're listening to me anyway, hi out there, uh, is in distributed systems where you've got a bunch of computational units that are collaborating with each other uh, over some kind of network typically, uh, you often have the problem where if, if everyone behaves deterministically, they, they all try to do the same thing at the same time and bad stuff happens. And in that setting, randomness is really, really great for breaking symmetry. This is something that the book talks about, and it's probably the simplest use of randomization that the book talks about, so I, I'd love for you to go in and take a look at it. The classic example of this is the randomized exponential backoff algorithm that's used for uh, broadcasting over an ethernet. Uh, um, so basically, if a bunch of agents all try to broadcast over an Ethernet connection at the same time, and the same is true for any broadcast channel, like a wireless network in a room, um, they're going to collide with each other. Uh, so, you know, in class, if, if everybody is talking, 
Uh, if two people talk at once, you typically can't understand what either one of them says, so you have to wait so that one person will talk. But if you use a deterministic algorithm for every independent agent to decide when they're going to talk, they're going to be like, I'll try talking, blah, and they both talk at the same time. And then they're like, oh, I will wait for exactly two seconds, and then I'll try talking. And two seconds later, they'll both be like, blah, and then they'll say, oh, I'd better wait even longer. I'll wait four seconds, and then I'll talk. And, and they're just going to keep running into each other. This is, uh, you've, you've had this happen when you're like walking down the sidewalk and somebody else is walking towards you and you step to the left to get out of their way but they step to the right so they're still in your way and then you both step the other direction and you both step the other direction and you keep getting in each other's way and it's kind of funny right because what usually happens is the two of you make independent decisions and you manage to make different decisions and so you get past each other so that's a good use of randomization